Book One, Chapter Three of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume One, by Jean Henri Mel de Bigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three, Relics, Easter Merriment, Corruption of the Clergy, A Priest's Family, Education, Ignorance let us now attend to the state of the church before the reformation the people of christendom no longer expecting the gratuitous gift of eternal life from the true and living god it was necessary in order to obtain it to have recourse to all the methods which a superstitious timid and frightened conscience could invent heaven is full of saints and mediators who can solicit the favour earth is full of pious works sacrifices observances and ceremonies which can merit it such is the picture of the religion of this period as drawn by one who was long a monk and afterwards a fellow worker with luther myconius says the sufferings and merits of christ were as a vain tale or as the fables of homer not a word was said of the faith by which the righteousness of the saviour and the inheritance of eternal life are secured christ was a severe judge ready to condemn all who did not recur to the intercession of saints or the indulgences of popes instead of him there figured as intercessors first the virgin mary like the diana of paganism and after her saints of whom the popes were continually enlarging the catalogue these mediators gave the benefit of their prayers only to those who had deserved well of the orders founded by them for this it was necessary to do not what god commands in his word but a great number of works which monks and priests had devised and which brought in large sums of money these were ave marias prayers of st ursula and st bridget it was necessary to chant and cry night and day there were as many places of pilgrimage as there were mountains forests or valleys but these toils might be bought off with money money therefore and everything that had any value chickens geese ducks eggs wax straw butter and cheese were brought to the convents and to the priests then chants resounded and bells were rung perfumes filled the sanctuary and sacrifices were offered kitchens were stuffed glasses rattled and masses winding up threw a cover over all these pious works the bishops did not preach but they consecrated priests bells monks churches chapels images books cemeteries all these things yielding large returns bones arms and feet were presented in gold and silver boxes they were given out to be kissed during mass and this too yielded a large profit all these folks maintained that the pope being in the place of god second thessalonians chapter two verse four could not be deceived and they would not hear of anything to the contrary in the church of all saints at wittenberg were shown a piece of noah's ark a small portion of soot from the furnace of the three young men a bit of the manger in which our saviour was laid hair from the beard of the great christopher and nineteen thousand other relics of greater or less value at schaffhausen was shown the breath of st joseph which nicodemus had received into his glove in Württemberg, a vendor of indulgences was seen selling his wares and having his head adorned with a large feather plucked from the wing of the archangel michael but there was no occasion to go a distance in quest of these precious treasures persons with hired relics travelled the country and hawked them about as has since been done with the holy scriptures the faithful having them thus brought to their houses were spared the trouble and expense of pilgrimage relics were exhibited with great ceremony in the churches while those travelling hawkers paid a fixed sum to the owners and also gave them so much percentage on their returns the kingdom of heaven had thus disappeared and men to supply its place on the earth had opened a disgraceful traffic in this way a profane spirit had invaded religion 
and the most sacred seasons of the church those which most forcibly and powerfully invited the faithful to self-examination and love were dishonoured by buffoonery and mere heathen blasphemies the easter drolleries held an important place in the acts of the church as the festival of the resurrection required to be celebrated with joy everything that could excite the laughter of the hearers was sought out and thrust into sermons one preacher imitated the note of the cuckoo while another hissed like a goose one dragged forward to the altar a layman in a cassock a second told the most indecent stories a third related the adventures of the apostle peter among others how in a tavern he cheated the host by not paying his score the inferior clergy took advantage of the occasion to turn their superiors into ridicule the churches were thus turned into stages and the priests into mountebanks if such was the state of religion what must that of morals have been it is true and equity requires we should not forget that at this time corruption was not universal even when the reformation took place much piety righteousness and religious vigour were brought to light of this the mere sovereignty of god was the cause but still how can it be denied that he had previously deposited the germs of this new life in the bosom of the church in our own day were all the immoralities and abominations which are committed in a single country brought together the mass of corruption would undoubtedly fill us with alarm still it is true that at this period evil presented itself in a form and with a universality which it has never had since in particular the abomination of desolation was seen standing in the holy place to an extent which has not been permitted since the period of the reformation with faith morality had decayed the glad tidings of eternal life is the power of god for the regeneration of man but take away the salvation which god gives and you take away purity of heart and life this was proved by the event the doctrine and the sale of indulgences operated on an ignorant people as a powerful stimulus to evil it is no doubt true that according to the doctrine of the church indulgences were of use only to those who promised to amend and actually kept their promise but what was to be expected of a doctrine which had been invented with a view to the profit which it might be made to yield the vendors of indulgences the better to dispose their wares were naturally disposed to present them in the most winning and seductive form even the learned were not too well informed on the subject while the only thing seen by the multitude was that indulgences gave them permission to sin the merchants were in no haste to disabuse them of an error so greatly in favour of the trade in those ages of darkness what disorders and crimes must have prevailed when impunity could be purchased with money what ground could there be for fear when a trifling contribution to build a church procured exemption from punishment in the world to come what hope of renovation when all direct communication between men and their god had ceased when estranged from him their spirit and life they moved to and fro among the frivolous ceremonies and crude observances in an atmosphere of death the priests were the first to yield to the corrupting influence in wishing to raise they had lowered themselves they had tried to steal from god a ray of his glory that they might place it in their own bosom but instead of this had only placed in it some of the leaven of corruption stolen from the evil one the annals of the period teem with scandalous stories in many places people were pleased to see their priest keeping a mistress in the hope that it might secure their wives from seduction how humbling the scene which the house of such a priest must have presented the unhappy man maintained the woman and the children she might have borne him out of tithes and alms his conscience upbraided him he blushed before his people his servants and his god the woman fearing that in the event of the priest's death she might become destitute sometimes made provision beforehand and played the thief in her own house her honour was gone 
and her children were a living accusation against her objects of universal contempt both parties rushed into quarrelling and dissipation such was the home of a priest in these fearful scenes the people read a lesson of which they were not slow to avail themselves the rural districts became the theatre of numerous excesses the places where priests resided were often the abodes of dissoluteness corneille adrian at bruges and abbot trinkler at capel imitated the manners of the east and had their harems priests associating with low company frequented taverns and played at dice crowning their orgies with quarrels and blasphemy the council of schaffhausen issued an order forbidding priests to dance in public except at marriages or to carry more than one kind of weapon they moreover ordered that such priests as were found in houses of bad fame should be stripped of their cassocks in the archbishopric of mayence they leapt the walls at night and then shouted and revelled in all sorts of debauchery within taverns and inns doors and locks were not secure from their attacks in several places each priest was liable to the bishop in a certain tax for the female he kept and for every child she bore him one day a german bishop who was attending a great festival openly declared that in a single year the number of priests who had been brought before him for this purpose amounted to eleven thousand this account is given by erasmus among the higher orders of the priesthood the corruption was equally great the dignitaries of the church preferred the turmoil of camps to chanting at the altar and to take lance in hand and reduce those around them to obedience was one of the first qualities of a bishop baldwin of tours who was constantly warring with his vassals and neighbours raised their castles built others of his own and thought of nothing but enlarging his territory it is told of a certain bishop of eichstadt that when he sat in his court he had a coat of mail under his gown and a large sword in his hand one of his sayings was that in a fair fight he was not afraid of five bavarians the bishops and the inhabitants of the towns where they resided were perpetually at war the burghers demanded freedom while the priests insisted on absolute obedience when the latter proved victorious they punished revolt and satiated their vengeance with numbers of victims but the flame of insurrection burst forth at the very moment when they imagined they had suppressed it and what a spectacle was presented by the pontifical throne at the period immediately preceding the reformation to say the truth even rome was not often witness to such infamy rodrigo borgia after he had lived with a lady of rome continued the same illegitimate intercourse with her daughter rosa venozza and had five children by her this man a cardinal and an archbishop was living at rome with venozza and other females besides frequenting churches and hospitals when the pontifical chair became vacant by the death of innocent the eighth borgia secured it by buying each cardinal for a regular price four mules loaded with gold publicly entered the palace of cardinal sforza the most influential among them borgia became pope under the name of alexander the sixth and was delighted at having thus reached the pinnacle of pleasure on his coronation day he appointed his son caesar a youth of ferocious temper and dissolute habits archbishop of valentia and bishop of pampeluna then when his daughter lucretia was married he celebrated the occasion in the vatican with fates which were attended by his mistress julia bella and enlivened by comedies and obscene songs all the ecclesiastics says a historian had mistresses and all the convents of the capital were houses of bad fame caesar borgia espoused the faction of the guelphs and when by their assistance he had destroyed the gibbelins he turned round upon the guelphs and in like manner destroyed them but he was unwilling that any should share the spoil with him and therefore after alexander had in fourteen ninety seven made his eldest son duke of benevento the duke disappeared george Schiavoni, a dealer in wood on the banks of the tiber one night saw a dead body thrown into the river but said nothing 
such occurrences were common the dead body proved to be that of the duke who had been murdered by his brother caesar nor was this enough having taken offence at his brother-in-law he made him be stabbed on the stair of the pontifical palace the wounded man covered with blood was carried to his apartment where he was constantly watched by his wife and sister who dreading caesar's poison prepared his food with their own hands alexander placed sentinels at his door but caesar laughed at their precautions and as the pope was going to see his son-in-law caesar said to him what is not done at dinner will be done at supper in short he one day forced his way into the room drove out the wife and sister and calling in his executioner michelotto the only person to whom he showed any confidence looked on while his brother-in-law was strangled alexander had a favourite named Pirotto. the pope's partiality for him offended the young duke he pursued him and Pirotto, taking refuge under the pontifical mantle clasped the pope in his arms caesar stabbed him and the blood of his victim sprung into the pontiff's face the pope adds a contemporary witness to these scenes loves his son the duke and is much afraid of him caesar was the handsomest and most powerful man of his age he fought with six wild bulls and dispatched them with ease every morning at rome persons were found who had been assassinated during the night while poison carried off those whom the sword could not reach men dared not to move or breathe in rome every one trembling till his own turn should arrive caesar borgia was the hero of crime the spot of earth where iniquity attained this dreadful height was the pontifical throne when once man has given himself over to the powers of darkness the higher station he pretends to occupy in the sight of god the deeper he sinks into the abysses of hell the dissolute fates which were given in the pontifical palace by the pope his son caesar and his daughter lucretia cannot be described or even thought of without horror the impure groves of antiquity perhaps never saw the like historians have accused alexander and lucretia of incest but the proof seems defective the pope had prepared poison for a rich cardinal in a small box of comfits which were to be served after a sumptuous repast the cardinal being put on his guard bribed the steward and the poisoned box was placed before alexander who ate of it and died the whole city ran to see the dead viper and could not get enough of the sight such was the man who occupied the pontifical see at the beginning of the century in which the reformation commenced the clergy having thus brought religion and themselves into disrepute a powerful voice might well exclaim the ecclesiastical state is opposed to god and to his glory the people well know this and but too well do they show it by the many songs proverbs and jests against priests which are current among the lower classes and by all those caricatures of monks and priests which we see on all the walls and even on playing cards every man feels disgust when he sees or when he hears of an ecclesiastic these are luther's words the evil had spread through all ranks a spirit of error had been sent to men corruption of manners kept pace with corruption of faith and a mystery of iniquity lay like an incubus on the enslaved church of jesus christ there was another consequence which necessarily resulted from the oblivion into which the fundamental doctrine of the gospel had fallen ignorance was the companion of corruption the priests having taken into their own hands the distribution of a salvation which belongs only to god deemed this a sufficient title to the respect of the people what occasion had they to study sacred literature their business was not to expound the scriptures but to give diplomas of indulgence a ministry which called not for the laborious acquisition of extensive knowledge in the rural districts says wimpelling the persons selected for preachers were miserable creatures who had been previously raised from beggary cast off cooks musicians huntsmen grooms and still worse 
the higher clergy were often sunk in deep ignorance a bishop of dunfeld congratulated himself that he had never learned either greek or hebrew while the monks contended that all heresies sprung out of these languages and especially out of the greek the new testament said one of them is a book full of briars and serpents the greek continued he is a new language recently invented and of it we ought specially to beware as to hebrew my dear brethren it is certain that all who learn it that very instant become jews we quote from heresbach a friend of erasmus and a respectable writer thomas linacre a learned and celebrated ecclesiastic had never read the new testament in the last days of his life in fifteen twenty four he caused a copy of it to be brought but immediately dashed it from him with an oath because on opening it he had lighted on these words i say unto you swear not at all now he was a great swearer either this is not the gospel said he or we are not christians even the theological faculty of paris did not hesitate at this time to say in the presence of the parliament it is all over with religion if the study of greek and hebrew is allowed if among ecclesiastics there were a scattered few who had made some attainments it was not in sacred literature the ciceronians of italy affected a great contempt for the bible because of its style men calling themselves priests of the church of jesus christ translated the writings of holy men inspired by the spirit of god into the style of virgil and horace in order to adapt them to the ears of good society cardinal bembo instead of the holy spirit wrote the breath of the heavenly zephyr instead of to forgive sins to bend the manes and the sovereign god and instead of christ the son of god minerva sprung from the forehead of jupiter having one day found the respectable sadolet engaged in translating the epistle to the romans he said to him leave off this child's play such trifling ill becomes a man of gravity such are some of the consequences of the system under which christendom then groaned our picture undoubtedly proves both the corruption of the church and the necessity of a reformation and it was this we proposed in sketching it the vital doctrines of christianity had almost entirely disappeared and with them the light and life which constitute the essence of genuine religion the strength of the church had been wasted and its body enfeebled and exhausted lay stretched almost without life over the whole extent which the roman empire had occupied end of book one chapter three book one chapter four of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume one by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by christopher smith chapter four christianity imperishable opposition to rome frederick the wise his character his anticipation the evils which then afflicted christendom that is superstition infidelity ignorance vain speculation and corruption of manners all natural fruits of the human heart were not new upon the earth often they had figured in the history of states in the east especially various religions which had had their day of glory but had become enervated had been attacked by them and yielding to the assault had fallen under it never again to rise is christianity to experience the same fate will she be destroyed like these ancient popular religions will the blow which gave them death be strong enough to deprive her of life is there nothing that can save her will those hostile powers that now oppress her and which have already overthrown so many other forms of worship be able to seat themselves without opposition on the ruins of the church of jesus christ no there is in christianity what there was not in any of these popular religions 
it does not like them present certain abstract ideas interwoven with traditions and fables destined to fall sooner or later under the attacks of human reason it contains pure truth founded on facts capable of standing the scrutiny of every upright and enlightened mind christianity does not aim merely at exciting certain vague religious sentiments which when they have once lost their charm cannot be again revived its end is to satisfy and it in fact does satisfy all the religious wants of human nature whatever the degree of refinement to which it may have attained it is not the work of man whose labours fade and are effaced it is the work of god who sustains what he creates and the pledge of its duration is the promise of its divine head it is impossible that human nature can ever rise so high as to look down on christianity or if for a time human nature do think herself able to dispense with it it soon appears with renewed youth and life as alone fit for curing souls degenerate nations then return with new ardour to those ancient simple and powerful truths which in the hour of their infatuation they had turned from with disdain christianity in fact displayed in the sixteenth century the same regenerating power which it had exerted in the first after fifteen centuries the same truths produced the same results in the days of the reformation as in those of paul and peter the gospel with invincible force overthrew the mightiest obstacles its sovereign power was manifested from north to south among nations differing most widely from each other in manners character and intellectual development then as in the days of stephen and james it lighted up the fire of enthusiasm and devotedness in nations which seemed almost extinguished and exalted them even to the height of martyrdom how was this revival of the church and of the world accomplished the observer might then have seen the operation of two laws by which god governs the world at all times first he has ages to act in he begins his preparations leisurely and long before the event which he designs to accomplish then when the time is come he produces the greatest results by the smallest means it is thus he acts in nature and history when he wishes an immense tree to grow he deposits a little grain in the earth and when he wishes to renew his church he employs the humblest instrument to accomplish what emperors and all the learned and eminent in the church were unable to perform by and by we will search for and we will discover this little seed which a divine hand deposited in the earth in the days of the reformation but at present let us endeavour to ascertain the various means by which god prepared this great event at the period when the reformation was ready to burst forth rome appeared to be in peace and safety one would even have said that nothing could disturb her triumph after the great victories which she had gained general councils those upper and lower houses of catholicity had been subdued the vaudois and the hussites had been suppressed no university with the exception perhaps of that of paris which sometimes raised its voice when its kings gave the signal doubted the infallibility of the oracles of rome each seemed to have accepted his allotted share in her power the higher clergy deemed it better to give a distant chief the tenth part of their revenues and quietly consume the other nine than to hazard all for an independence which would cost much and yield little the lower clergy decoyed by the perspective of rich benefices which ambition made them fancy and discover in the distance were willing by a little slavery to realize the flattering hopes which they entertained besides they were almost everywhere so oppressed by the chiefs of the hierarchy that they could scarcely struggle under their powerful grasp far less rise boldly and hold up their heads the people knelt before the roman altar and kings themselves though they began in secret to despise the bishop of rome durst not venture to attack his power with a hand which the age would have deemed sacrilegious 
but opposition if it seemed externally to have slackened or even ceased when the reformation burst forth had more inward strength a nearer view of the edifice will disclose to us more than one symptom which presaged its downfall general councils though vanquished had diffused their principles throughout the church and carried division into the enemy's camp the defenders of the hierarchy were divided into two parties that is those who maintained the system of absolute papal domination on the principles of hildebrand and those who were desirous of a constitutional papal government offering guarantees and giving liberty to the churches nor was this the whole faith in the infallibility of the roman bishop was greatly shaken among all parties and if no voice was raised in opposition to it it was because every one rather desired anxiously to retain the little faith in it which he still had the least shock was dreaded because it might overturn the edifice christendom held in its breath but it was to prevent a disaster by which its own existence might have been endangered from the moment when man trembles at the thought of abandoning a long venerated belief it has lost its influence over him and even the appearance of respect which he may be desirous to keep up will not be long maintained the reformation had been gradually prepared in three different worlds the political the ecclesiastical and the literary political bodies private christians and theologians the literary and the learned all contributed to the revolution of the sixteenth century let us take a survey of this triple opposition concluding with the literary class though at the period immediately preceding the revolution it was perhaps the most powerful of all first among political bodies rome had lost much of its ancient credit of this the church herself was the primary cause for properly speaking it was not the errors and superstitions which she had introduced into christianity that gave the fatal blow before christendom could have been able to condemn her on this account it must have stood higher than the church in respect of intellectual and religious development but there was a class of things which the laity well understood and it was by these they judged the church she had become of the earth earthy the sacerdotal empire which tyrannized over the nations existed solely by the illusions of its subjects and having a halo for its crown had forgotten its nature and left heaven with his spheres of light and glory to plunge into the vulgar interests of burghers and princes though representing those who were born of the spirit the priests had exchanged the spirit for the flesh they had abandoned the treasures of knowledge and the spiritual power of the word for the brute force and tinkling of the age the thing happened naturally enough at first the church pretended that her object was to defend spiritual order but in order to protect it from the opposition and assaults of the people she had resorted to earthly means to vulgar weapons which a false prudence had induced her to take up when the church had once begun to handle such weapons her spirituality was at an end her arm could not become temporal without rendering her heart temporal also the appearance presented soon became the reverse of what it had been at the outset at first she had thought proper to employ the earth in defending heaven now she employed heaven to defend the earth theocratic forms became in her hands merely a mean of accomplishing worldly interests the offerings which the people laid at the feet of the sovereign pontiff of christendom were expended in maintaining the luxury of his court and the soldiers of his armies his spiritual power served him as a ladder on which to climb and then put the kings and nations of the earth under his feet the charm broke and the power of the church was lost as soon as the men of the world could say she is become as one of us the great were the first to examine the titles of this imaginary power this examination might perhaps have been sufficient to overthrow rome but happily for her the education of princes was everywhere in the hands of her adepts these inspired their august pupils with sentiments of veneration for the roman pontiff 
the rulers of the people grew up within the sanctuary and princes of ordinary capacity could never entirely quit it several even had no other ambition than to be found in it at the hour of death they preferred to die under a cassock rather than a crown italy that apple of discord in europe perhaps contributed most to open the eyes of kings having occasion to communicate with popes on matters which concerned the temporal prince of the states of the church and not the bishop of bishops they were greatly astonished when they saw them ready to sacrifice rights which appertained to the pontiff in order to secure certain advantages to the prince they discovered that these pretended organs of truth had recourse to all the petty wiles of politics to deceit dissimulation and perjury then at length the bandage which education had tied upon the eyes of princes fell off then wily ferdinand of aragon tried stratagem against stratagem then the impetuous louis the twelfth caused a medal to be struck with this inscription perdam babylonis nomen i will destroy the name of babylon and honest maximilian of austria grieved to the heart on learning the treachery of leo the tenth declared openly henceforth this pope too is to me nothing better than a villain now i can say that throughout my life not one pope has kept faith with me or been true to his word if it please god i hope that this one will be the last kings and states began moreover to feel impatient under the heavy burden which the popes imposed on them and to demand that rome should free them from contributions and annats which wasted their resources already had france opposed rome with a pragmatic sanction and the heads of the empire claimed to share in it in fifteen eleven the emperor took part in the council of pisa and even had at one time an idea of seizing the popedom for himself but among the rulers of the people none were so useful to the reformation as the prince in whose states it was to commence of all the electors of that period the most powerful was frederick of saxony surnamed the wise having succeeded in fourteen eighty seven to the hereditary states of his family he had received the electoral dignity from the emperor and in fourteen ninety three undertook a pilgrimage to jerusalem where he was dubbed knight of the holy sepulchre his power and influence his riches and liberality raised him above all his equals god chose him to be the tree under whose shelter the seed of truth might be able to push forth its first blade without being uprooted by storms from without no man was better fitted for this noble service frederick possessed the general esteem and in particular had the entire confidence of the emperor whom he even represented in his absence his wisdom consisted not in the dexterous arts of a wily politician but in an enlightened and foreseeing prudence the first maxim of which was never to offer violence from interested motives to the laws of honour and religion at the same time he felt in his heart the power of the word of god one day when staupitz the vicar-general was with him the conversation turned upon those who entertained the people with vain declamation all discourses said the elector which are filled only with subtleties and human traditions are wondrously cold nerveless and feeble it is impossible to advance one subtlety which another subtlety cannot destroy the holy scriptures alone are clothed with such power and majesty that destroying all our learned logical contrivances they press us home and constrain us to exclaim never man so spake staupitz having signified that he was entirely of this opinion the elector shook him cordially by the hand and said promise me that you will always think so frederick was just the prince required at the outset of the reformation too much feebleness on the part of its friends might have allowed it to be strangled while too much haste might have caused the storm which at the very first began with hollow murmuring sound to gather against it to burst too soon frederick was moderate but strong he had that christian virtue which god always requires in those who would adore his ways he waited upon god he put in practice the wise counsel of gamaliel 
if this counsel or this work be of men it will come to naught but if it be of god ye cannot overthrow it acts chapter five verses thirty eight and thirty nine matters said this prince to spengler of nuremberg one of the most enlightened men of his time matters are come to such a point that there is nothing more which men can do in them god alone must act to his mighty hand therefore we commit these great events which are too difficult for us providence made an admirable choice in selecting such a prince to protect his work in its infancy end of book one chapter four book one chapter five of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume one by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by christopher smith chapter five the empire national character switzerland italy spain portugal france netherlands england scotland the north russia poland bohemia hungary the discoveries made by kings had gradually extended to their subjects the wise began to habituate themselves to the idea that the bishop of rome was only a man and sometimes even a very bad man they had a suspicion that he was no holier than the bishops whose reputation was very equivocal the licentiousness of the popes roused the indignation of christendom and hatred of the roman name rankled in the hearts of the nations numerous causes concurred in facilitating the deliverance of the different countries of the west let us glance at these countries the empire was a confederation of different states with an emperor at their head each state having supreme authority within its own territory the imperial diet composed of all the princes or sovereign states legislated for the whole germanic body it belonged to the emperor to ratify laws decrees or resolutions of the assembly and to see them applied and carried into execution while the seven most powerful princes under the title of electors had the disposal of the imperial crown the north of germany inhabited chiefly by the ancient saxon race had acquired the greatest degree of freedom the emperor incessantly attacked by the turks in his hereditary possessions was obliged to court those princes and bold nations whose aid was then necessary to him free towns in the north west and south of the empire had by their trade their manufactures and exertions of every description risen to a high degree of prosperity and thereby of independence but the powerful house of austria then invested with the imperial crown held the greater part of the southern states of germany under its control and closely watched their movements it was preparing to extend its dominion over the whole empire and even beyond it when the reformation interposed a mighty barrier to its encroachments and saved the independence of europe as judea when christianity arose was in the centre of the ancient world so germany was in the centre of christendom looking at once towards the netherlands england france switzerland italy hungary bohemia poland denmark and all the north it was in the heart of europe that the principle of life was to be developed and the beatings of this heart were to circulate through all the arteries of the body the noble blood which was to give animation to all its members the particular constitution which the empire had received conformably to the dispensation of providence favoured the propagation of new ideas had germany been a monarchy properly so called like france or england the arbitrary will of the monarch might have been able long to arrest the progress of the gospel but it was a confederation truth attacked in one state might be received with favour in another the internal peace which maximilian had just secured for the empire was not less favourable to the reformation for a long time the numerous members of the germanic body had taken pleasure in tearing each other naught had been seen but trouble and discord 
war incessantly renewed neighbor against neighbor town against town and noble against noble maximilian had given a solid basis to public order by erecting the imperial chamber with power to decide in all questions between different states the inhabitants of germany after all their troubles and disquietudes saw the commencement of a new era of security and repose nevertheless when luther appeared germany still presented to the observing eye that kind of motion which agitates the sea after long protracted storms the calm was uncertain more than one example of this will be seen as we proceed by giving an entirely new impulse to the germanic nations the reformation put an end for ever to all the former causes of agitation destroying the system of barbarism which had till then been paramount it put europe in possession of a new system christianity had at the same time exercised a peculiar influence on germany the middle classes had made rapid improvement throughout the different quarters of the empire and more especially in the free towns were numerous institutions well fitted to improve the great mass of the population in these the arts flourished the burghers devoting themselves in security to the calm toils and sweet relations of social life became more and more accessible to knowledge and in this way were continually acquiring new influence and authority the foundation of the reformation in germany was not to be laid by magistrates who must often shape their conduct according to political exigencies nor by nobles fired with the love of military glory nor by a greedy and ambitious clergy working religion for profit as if it were their exclusive property the task was reserved for the citizens the commonalty the great body of the people the national character of the germans was specially fitted to adapt itself to a religious reformation no spurious civilization had enervated it the precious seed which the fear of god deposits in the bosom of a people had not been thrown to the winds ancient manners yet existed displaying themselves in that integrity and fidelity that love of labour that perseverance that serious temper which is still to be seen and gives presage of greater success to the gospel than the cheering levity or boorish temper of some other european nations the people of germany were indebted to rome for the great instrument of modern civilization that is faith polish learning laws all save their courage and their arms had come from the sacerdotal city and in consequence germany had ever after been in close alliance with the papacy the one was a kind of spiritual conquest by the other and we all know to what purposes rome has invariably applied her conquests nations which were in possession of faith and civilization before a roman pontiff existed always maintained in regard to him a greater measure of independence still the more thorough the subjugation of the german the more powerful will the reaction be when the period of awakening shall arrive when germany does open her eyes she will indignantly break loose from the chains which have so long held her captive the bondage she has had to endure will make her more sensible of her need of deliverance and freedom and bold champions of the truth will come forth from this house of hard labour and bondage in which all her people have for ages been confined there was at that time in germany what the politicians of our days call a seesaw system when the emperor was of a resolute character his power increased when on the contrary he was of a feeble character the influence and power of the princes and electors were enlarged never had these felt themselves stronger in regard to their chief than in the time of maximilian at the period of the reformation and as he took part against it it is easy to understand how favourable the circumstance of his comparative weakness must have been to the propagation of the gospel moreover germany was tired of what the romans derisively styled the patience of the germans they had indeed shown much patience from the days of louis of bavaria when the emperors laid down their arms and the tiara was placed without opposition above the crown of the caesars 
the contest however had done little more than change its place by descending several steps the same struggles which the emperors and popes had exhibited to the world were soon renewed on a smaller scale in all the towns of germany between the bishops and the magistrates the burghers took up the sword which the emperors had allowed to drop from their hands as early as thirteen twenty nine the burghers of frankfurt on the oder had intrepidly withstood all their ecclesiastical superiors excommunicated for having continued faithful to the margrave louis they had been left for twenty-eight years without mass baptism marriage or christian burial and when the monks and priests made their re-entry they laughed at it as a comedy or farce sad symptoms doubtless but symptoms of which the clergy were the cause at the period of the reformation this opposition between the magistrates and ecclesiastics had increased the privileges of the former and the temporal pretensions of the latter were constantly causing jostling and collision between the two bodies but burgomasters councillors and secretaries of towns were not the only persons among whom rome and the clergy found opponents wrath was at the same time fermenting among the people and broke out as early as fifteen hundred and two when the peasantry indignant at the grinding yoke of their ecclesiastical sovereigns entered into a combination which goes under the name of the shoe alliance thus everywhere both in the upper and lower regions of society a grumbling sound was heard a precursor of the thunder which was soon to burst germany seemed ripe for the work which the sixteenth century had received as its task providence which moves leisurely had everything prepared and the very passions which god condemns were to be overruled by his mighty hand for the accomplishment of his designs let us see how other nations were situated thirteen small republics placed with their confederates in the centre of europe among mountains forming as it were its citadel contained a brave and simple people who would have gone to those obscure valleys in quest of persons who with the sons of germany might be the deliverers of the church who would have thought that petty unknown towns just emerging from barbarism hid behind inaccessible mountains at the extremity of nameless lakes would in point of christianity take precedence of jerusalem antioch ephesus corinth and rome nevertheless it so pleased him who wills that one spot of earth to be watered with dew and that another spot on which the rain has not descended shall remain parched amos there were other circumstances besides which might have been expected to throw numerous obstacles in the way of the reformation among the helvetic republics if in a monarchy the impediments of power were to be dreaded the thing to be feared in a democracy was the precipitation of the people but switzerland had also had its preparations it was a wild but noble tree which had been preserved in the bosom of the valleys in order that a valuable fruit might one day be engrafted on it providence had diffused among this new people principles of independence and freedom destined to display their full power whenever the signal for contest with rome should be given the pope had given the swiss the title of protectors of the liberty of the church but they seem to have taken the honourable appellation in a very different sense from the pontiff if their soldiers guarded the pope in the vicinity of the ancient capital their citizens in the bosom of the alps carefully guarded their religious liberties against the assaults of the pope and the clergy ecclesiastics were forbidden to apply to a foreign jurisdiction the letter of the priests Pfaffenbrief, thirteen seventy was an energetic protestation of swiss liberty against the abuses and power of the clergy amongst these states zurich was distinguished for its courageous opposition to the pretensions of rome geneva at the other extremity of switzerland was at war with its bishop these two towns particularly signalized themselves in the great struggle which we have undertaken to describe but if the swiss towns accessible to every kind of improvement were among the first to fall in with the movement of reform it was otherwise with the inhabitants of the mountains 
the light had not yet travelled so far these cantons the founders of swiss freedom proud of the part which they had performed in the great struggle for independence were not readily disposed to imitate their younger brethren of the plains why change the faith with which they had chased austria and which had by its altars consecrated all the scenes of their triumph their priests were the only enlightened guides to whom they could have recourse their worship and their festivals gave a turn to the monotony of their tranquil life and pleasantly broke the silence of their peaceful retreats they remained impervious to religious innovation on crossing the alps we find ourselves in that italy which was in the eyes of the majority the holy land of christendom whence should europe have expected the good of the church if not from italy if not from rome might not the power which by turns raised so many different characters to the pontifical chair one day place in it a pontiff who would become an instrument of blessing to the heritage of the lord or if pontiffs were to be despaired of were there not bishops and councils who might reform the church nothing good comes out of nazareth but out of jerusalem out of rome such might be the thoughts of men but god thought otherwise he said let him who is filthy be filthy still revelation twenty two and abandoned italy to her iniquities this land of ancient glory was alternately a prey to intestine wars and foreign invasion the wilds of politics the violence of faction the turmoil of war seemed to have sole sway and to banish far away both the gospel and its peace besides italy broken dismembered and without unity seemed little fitted to receive a common impulse each frontier was a new barrier where truth was arrested and if the truth was to come from the north how could the italians with a taste so refined and a society in their eyes so exquisite condescend to receive anything at the hands of the barbarous germans were men who admired the cadence of a sonnet more than the majesty and simplicity of the scriptures a propitious soil for the seed of the divine word but be this as it may in regard to italy rome was still to continue rome not only did the temporal power of the popes dispose the different italian factions to purchase their alliance and favour at any price but in addition to this the universal ascendancy of rome presented various attractions to the avarice and vanity of the ultramontane states the moment that the question of emancipating the rest of the world from rome should be raised italy would again become italy domestic quarrels would not prevail to the advantage of a foreign system attacks on the head of the peninsular family would at once revive affections and common interests which had long been in abeyance the reformation had therefore little chance in that quarter and yet there did exist beyond the mountains individuals who had been prepared to receive the gospel light and italy was not entirely disinherited spain had what italy had not a grave noble and religiously disposed people at all times has it numbered men of piety and learning among its clergy while it was distant enough from rome to be able to easily shake off the yoke there are few nations where one might have more reasonably hoped for a revival of that primitive christianity which spain perhaps received from st paul himself and yet spain did not raise her head among the nations she was destined to fulfil the declaration of divine wisdom the first shall be last various circumstances led to this sad result spain in consequence of its isolated position and its distance from germany must have felt only slight shocks of the great earthquake which so violently heaved the empire it was moreover engrossed with treasures very different from those which the word of god then offered to the nations the new world eclipsed the eternal world a land altogether new and apparently silver and gold inflamed all imaginations an ardent desire for riches left no room in a spanish heart for nobler thoughts a powerful clergy with scaffolds and treasures at its disposal ruled the peninsula
the spaniard willingly yielded a servile obedience to his priests who disburdening him of the prior claims of spiritual occupation left him free to follow his passions and to run the way of riches discoveries and new continents victorious over the moors spain had at the expense of her noblest blood pulled down the crescent from the walls of granada and many other cities and in its place planted the cross of jesus christ this great zeal for christianity which seemed to give bright hopes turned against the truth why should catholic spain which had vanquished infidelity not oppose heresy how should those who had chased mahomet from their lovely country allow luther to penetrate into it their kings did even more they fitted out fleets against the reformation and in their eagerness to vanquish it went to seek it in holland and england but these attacks aggrandized the nations against which they were directed and their power soon crushed spain in this way these catholic regions lost through the reformation even that temporal prosperity which was the primary cause of their rejection of the spiritual liberty of the gospel nevertheless it was a brave and generous people that dwelt beyond the pyrenees several of their noble sons with the same ardour but with more light than those who had shed their blood in moorish dungeons came to lay their life as an offering on the faggot piles of the inquisition it was nearly the same with portugal as with spain emmanuel the happy gave it an age of gold which must have unfitted it for the self-denial which the gospel demands the portuguese rushing into the recently discovered route to the east indies and brazil turned their backs on europe and the reformation few nations might have been thought more disposed than france to receive the gospel almost all the intellectual and spiritual life of the middle ages centered in her one would have said that the paths were already beaten for a great manifestation of the truth men who were the most opposed to each other and who had the greatest influence on the french people felt that they had some affinity with the reformation st bernard had given an example of that heartfelt faith that inward piety which is the finest feature of the reformation while abelard had introduced into the study of theology that reasoning principle which incapable of establishing truth is powerful in destroying falsehood numerous heretics so called had rekindled the flames of the word of god in the french provinces the university of paris had withstood the church to the face and not feared to combat her at the beginning of the fifteenth century the clemanges and the gersons had spoken out boldly the pragmatic sanction had been a great act of independence and promised to prove the palladium of the gallican liberties the french nobility so numerous and so jealous of their precedents and who at this period had just seen their privileges gradually suppressed to the extension of the influence of the crown must have felt favourably disposed towards a religious revolution the effect of which might be to restore a portion of the independence which they had lost the people lively intelligent and open to generous emotions were accessible to the truth in a degree as great if not greater than any other people the reformation might have promised to be in this nation the birth that was to crown the long travail of many ages but the church of france which seemed for so many generations to have been rushing in the same direction turned suddenly round at the moment of the reformation and took a quite contrary direction such was the will of him who guides nations and their rulers the prince who then sat in the chariot and held the reins and who as a lover of letters might have been thought likely to be the first to second reform threw his people into another course the symptoms of several centuries proved fallacious and the impulse given to france struck and spent itself on the ambition and fanaticism of its kings the valois took the place which she ought to have occupied perhaps if she had received the gospel she would have become too powerful god was pleased to take the feeblest nations nations that as yet were not to make them the depositaries of his truth 
france after having been almost reformed ultimately found herself again become roman catholic the sword of princes thrown into the scale made it incline towards rome alas another sword that of the reformed themselves completed the ruin of the reformation hands habituated to the sword unlearned to pray it is by the blood of its confessors and not by that of its enemies that the gospel triumphs at this time the netherlands was one of the most flourishing countries in europe it contained an industrious population enlightened by the numerous relations which it maintained with the different quarters of the world full of courage and zealous to excess for its independence its privileges and its freedom placed on the threshold of germany it must have been one of the first to hear the sound of the reformation two parties quite distinct from each other occupied these provinces the more southern one was surfeited with wealth and submitted how could all those manufactures carried to the highest perfection how could that boundless traffic by land and sea how could bruges the great entrepot of the trade of the north how could antwerp that queen of commercial cities accommodate themselves to a long and sanguinary struggle for points of faith on the contrary the northern provinces defended by their sands the sea and their inland waters and still more by the simplicity of their manners and their determination to lose all sooner than the gospel not only saved their franchises their privileges and their faith but also conquered their independence and a glorious national character england scarcely seemed to promise what she has since performed repulsed from the continent where she had so long been obstinately bent on conquering france she began to throw her eye towards the ocean as the domain which was to be the true scene of her conquests and which was reserved for her inheritance twice converted to christianity once under the ancient britons and the second time under the anglo-saxons she very devoutly paid to rome the annual tribute of st peter but she was reserved for high destinies mistress of the ocean and present at once in all the different quarters of the globe she with the nations that were to spring from her was one day to be the hand of god in shedding the seeds of life over the remotest islands and the largest continents already several circumstances gave a presentiment of her destiny bright lights had shone in the british isles and some glimmerings still remained a multitude of foreigners artists merchants and mechanics arriving from the netherlands germany and other countries filled their cities and their seaports the new religious ideas must have been conveyed easily and rapidly in fine the reigning monarch was an eccentric prince who possessed of some knowledge and great courage was every moment changing his projects and ideas and turning from side to side according to the direction in which his violent passions blew it was possible that one of the inconsistencies of henry the eighth might prove favourable to the reformation scotland was at this time agitated by factions a king five years old a queen regent ambitious nobles and an influential clergy kept this bold nation in constant turmoil it was nevertheless one day to hold a first place among those that received the reformation the three kingdoms of the north denmark sweden and norway were united under a common sceptre these rude and warlike nations seemed to have little in common with the doctrine of love and peace and yet by their very energy they were perhaps more disposed than the people of the south to receive the evangelical doctrine in its power but the descendants of warriors and pirates they brought it would seem too warlike a character to the protestant cause at a later period their sword defended it with heroism russia retired at the extremity of europe had few relations with other states and belonged moreover to the greek communion the reformation effected in the western exerted little or no influence on the eastern church poland seemed well prepared for a reform the vicinity of the christians of bohemia and Boravia had disposed it to receive while the vicinity of germany must have rapidly communicated the evangelical impulse 
so early as fifteen hundred the nobility of poland proper had demanded the cup for the laity appealing to the usage of the primitive church the liberty enjoyed by its towns and the independence of its nobles made it a safe asylum for christians persecuted in their own country and the truth which they brought thither was received with joy by a great number of its inhabitants in our days however it is one of the countries which has the smallest number of confessors the flame of reformation which had long gleamed in bohemia had been almost extinguished in blood nevertheless precious remains which had escaped the carnage still survived to see the day of which john huss had a presentiment hungary had been torn by intestine wars under the government of princes without character and without experience and who had at last yoked the fate of their people to austria by giving this powerful house a place among the heirs of the crown such was the state of europe at the beginning of the sixteenth century which was destined to produce so mighty a transformation in christian society End of book one, chapter five. Book One, Chapter Six of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume One, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Christopher Smith. Chapter Six State of Theology, Witnesses for the Truth, The Vaudois, Wycliffe, Huss, Savonarola, John Vessel, proles having pointed out the state of nations and princes we now proceed to the preparation for reform as existing in theology and in the church the singular system of theology which had been established in the church must have powerfully contributed to open the eyes of the rising generation made for an age of darkness as if such an age had been to exist for ever it seemed destined to become obsolete and defective in all its parts as soon as the age should have improved such was the actual result the popes had from time to time made various additions to christian doctrine they had changed or taken away whatever did not accord with their hierarchy while anything not contrary to their system was allowed to remain till further orders this system contained true doctrines such as redemption and the influence of the holy spirit and these an able theologian if any such then existed might have employed to combat and overthrow all the rest the pure gold mingled with the worthless lead in the treasury of the vatican made it easy to detect the imposition it is true that when any bold opponent called attention to it the fanner of rome immediately threw out the pure grain but these very proceedings only increased the confusion this confusion was unbounded and the pretended unity was only a heap of disunion at rome there were doctrines of the court and doctrines of the church the faith of the metropolis differed from the faith of the provinces while in the provinces again the variation was endless there was a faith for princes a faith for the people and a faith for religious orders opinions were classed as belonging to such a convent such a district such a doctor such a monk truth in order to pass peacefully through the time when rome would have crushed her with an iron sceptre had done like the insect which with its threads forms the chrysalis in which it shuts itself up during the cold season and strange enough the instruments which divine truth had employed for the purpose were the so much decried schoolmen these industrious artisans of thought had employed themselves in unravelling all theological ideas and out of the numerous threads had made a veil under which the ablest of their contemporaries must have found it difficult to recognize the truth in its original purity 
it seems a sad thing that an insect full of life and sometimes glowing with the most brilliant colours should enclose itself apparently without life in its dark cocoon and yet it is the shroud that saves it it was the same with truth had the selfish and sinister policy of rome in the days of her ascendancy met the truth in naked simplicity she would have destroyed or at least tried to destroy it but disguised as it was by the theologians of the time under subtleties and endless distinctions the popes either saw it not or thought that in such a state it could not do them harm they accordingly patronized both the workmen and their work but spring might come and then forgotten truth might lift her head and throw aside her shroud in her seeming tomb having acquired new strength she might now again prove victorious over rome and all its errors this spring arrived at the moment when the absurd trappings of the schoolmen were falling off under the attack of skilful hands and amid the jeers of the new generation truth made her escape and came forth all young and beautiful but not merely did the writings of the schoolmen bear powerful testimony in favour of truth christianity had everywhere imparted a portion of her own life to the life of the people the church of christ was like a building which had fallen into ruin in digging among its foundations a portion of the solid rock on which it had been originally founded was discovered several institutions which dated from the pure times of the church were still existing and could not fail to suggest to many minds evangelical ideas at variance with the prevailing superstitions moreover the inspired writers and ancient doctors of the church whose writings were extant in many libraries occasionally sent forth a solitary voice and may we not hope that this voice was listened to in silence by more than one attentive ear let us not doubt and how sweet the thought christians had many brothers and many sisters in those monasteries in which we are too ready to see nothing but hypocrisy and dissoluteness the church had fallen in consequence of having lost the grand doctrine of justification by faith in the saviour and hence before she could rise it was necessary that this doctrine should be restored as soon as it was re-established in christendom all the errors and observances which had been introduced all that multitude of saints pious works penances masses indulgences etc behoved to disappear as soon as the one mediator and his one sacrifice were recognized all other mediators and other sacrifices were done away this article of justification says one who we may regard as divinely illumined on the subject is that which creates the church nourishes builds up preserves and defends her no man can teach well in the church or successively resist an adversary unless he hold fast by this truth this adds the writer from whom we quote is the heel which bruises the serpent's head god who was preparing his work raised up during the revolution of ages a long series of witnesses to the truth but the truth to which those noble men bore testimony they knew not with sufficient clearness or at least were unable to expound with sufficient distinctness incapable of accomplishing the work they were just what they should have been in order to prepare it we must add however that if they were not ready for the work the work was not ready for them the measure was not yet filled up ages had not accomplished their destined course and the need of a true remedy was not generally felt no sooner had rome usurped power than a powerful opposition was formed against her an opposition which extended across the middle ages in the ninth century archbishop claude of turin and in the twelfth century peter of bruges his disciple henry and arnold of brescia in france and in italy endeavour to establish the worship of god in spirit and in truth generally however in searching for this worship they confine it too much to the exclusion of images and external observances 
the mystics who have existed in almost all ages seeking in silence for holiness of heart purity of life and tranquil communion with god cast looks of sadness and dismay on the desolation of the church carefully abstaining from the scholastic brawls and useless discussions under which true piety had been buried they endeavoured to withdraw men from the vain mechanism of external worship and from the mire and glare of ceremonies that they might lead them to the internal repose enjoyed by the soul which seeks all its happiness in god this they could not do without coming at every point into collision with accredited opinions and without unveiling the sores of the church still they had no clear view of the doctrine of justification by faith the vaudois far superior to the mystics in purity of doctrine form a long chain of witnesses to the truth men enjoying more freedom than the rest of the church appear to have inhabited the heights of the alps in piedmont from ancient times and their numbers were increased and their doctrine purified by the followers of valdo from their mountain tops the vaudois during a long series of ages protest against the superstitions of rome they contend for the living hope which they have in god through christ for regeneration and inward renewal by faith hope and charity for the merits of jesus christ and the all-sufficiency of his righteousness and grace still however this primary truth of a sinner's justification this capital doctrine which ought to have risen from the midst of their doctrines like mont blanc from the bosom of the alps has not due prominence in their system its top is not high enough in eleven seventy peter vaud or valdo a rich merchant of lyon sells all his goods and gives to the poor he as well as his friends seem to have had it in view practically to realize the perfection of primitive christianity he accordingly begins in like manner with the branches and not the root nevertheless his word is powerful because of his appeal to scripture and shakes the roman hierarchy to its very foundations in thirteen hundred and sixty wycliffe appears in england and appeals from the pope to the word of god but the real internal sore of the church is in his eyes only one of the numerous symptoms of disease john huss lifts his voice in bohemia a century before luther lifts his in saxony he seems to penetrate farther than his predecessors into the essence of christian truth he asks christ to give him grace to glory only in his cross and in the inestimable weight of his sufferings but his attention is directed less against the errors of the roman church than the scandalous lives of its clergy he was however if we may so speak the john baptist of the reformation the flames of his martyrdom kindled a fire in the church which threw immense light on the surrounding darkness and the rays of which were not to be so easily extinguished john huss did more prophetic words came forth from the depths of his dungeon he had a presentiment that the true reformation of the church was at hand so early as the period when chased from prague he had been forced to wander in the plains of bohemia where his steps were followed by an immense crowd of eager hearers he had exclaimed the wicked have begun to lay perfidious nets for the bohemian goose but even if the goose which is only a domestic fowl a peaceful bird and which never takes a lofty flight into the air has however broken their toils other birds of loftier wing will break them with much greater force instead of a feeble goose the truth will send eagles and falcons with piercing eye the reformers fulfilled this prediction and after the venerable priest had been summoned before the council of constance after he had been thrown into prison the chapel of bethlehem where he had proclaimed the gospel and the future triumphs of jesus christ occupied him more than his defence one night the holy martyr thought he saw in the depths of his dungeon the features of jesus christ which he had caused to be painted on the walls of his study effaced by the pope and the bishops 
the dream distresses him but next day he sees several painters employed in restoring the pictures in greater number and splendour their task finished the painters surrounded by a great multitude exclaim now let popes and bishops come they shall never efface them more john huss adds many people in bethlehem rejoiced and i among them think of your defence rather than of dreams said his faithful friend chevalier de schlum to whom he had communicated the dream i am not a dreamer replied huss but this i hold for certain the image of christ will never be effaced they wished to destroy it but it will be painted anew in men's hearts by far abler preachers than i the nation which loves jesus christ will rejoice and i awaking among the dead and so to speak rising again from the tomb will thrill with joy a century elapsed and the torch of the gospel rekindled by the reformers did in fact illumine several nations which rejoiced in its light but in those ages a word of life is heard not only among those whom rome regards as its adversaries catholicity itself let us say it for our comfort contains in its bosom numerous witnesses to the truth the primitive edifice has been consumed but a noble fire is slumbering under its ashes and we see it from time to time throwing out brilliant sparks it is an error to suppose that up to the reformation christianity existed only under the roman catholic form and that at that period only a part of that church assumed the form of protestantism among the doctors who preceded the sixteenth century a great number doubtless inclined to the system which the council of trent proclaimed in fifteen sixty two but several also inclined to the doctrines professed at augsburg in fifteen hundred and thirty by the protestants the majority perhaps vibrated between the two anselm of canterbury lays down the doctrines of the incarnation and expiation as of the essence of christianity and in a treatise in which he teaches how to die he says to the dying person look only to the merits of jesus christ st bernard with powerful voice proclaims the mystery of redemption if my fault comes from another says he why should not my righteousness also be derived certainly it is far better for me to have it given me than to have it innate several schoolmen and after them chancellor gilson forcibly attacked the errors and abuses of the church but above all let us think of the thousands of obscure individuals unknown to the world who however possessed the true life of christ a monk named arnoldi daily in his quiet cell utters this fervent exclamation o oh, jesus christ my lord i believe that thou alone art my redemption and my righteousness christopher of uttenheim a pious bishop of baal causes his name to be written on a picture painted on glass and surrounds it with this inscription that he may have it always under his eye the cross of christ is my hope i seek grace and not works friar martin a poor carthusian wrote a touching confession in which he says o oh, most loving god i know there is no other way in which i can be saved and satisfy thy justice than by the merit the spotless passion and death of thy well-beloved son kind jesus all my salvation is in thy hands thou canst not turn the arms of thy love away from me for they created shaped and ransomed me in great mercy and in an ineffable manner thou hast engraved my name with an iron pen on thy side thy hands and thy feet etc then the good carthusian places his confession in a wooden box and deposits the box in a hole which he had made in the wall of his cell the piety of friar martin would never have been known had not the box been found twenty first of december seventeen seventy six in taking down an old tenement which had formed part of the carthusian convent at Baal. 
but this touching faith these holy men had only for themselves and knew not how to communicate to others living in retreat they might more or less say as in the writing which friar martin put into his box et si haec predicta confitere non possem lingua confiteo tamen corde et scripto that is and these things aforesaid if i cannot confess with the tongue i however confess with the heart and in writing the word of truth was in the sanctuary of some pious souls but to use a scripture expression it had not free course in the world still if the doctrine of salvation was not always confessed aloud there were some in the very bosom of the church of rome who at least feared not to declare openly against the abuses which dishonoured it scarcely had the councils of constant and baal which condemned huss and his followers been held than the noble series of witnesses against rome to which we have been pointing again appears with greater lustre men of a noble spirit revolting at the abominations of the papacy rise up like the prophets under the old testament like them sending forth a voice of thunder and with a similar fate their blood reddens the scaffold and their ashes are thrown to the wind thomas connecte a carmelite appears in flanders and declares that abominations are done at rome that the church has need of reformation and that in the service of god one must not fear the excommunications of the pope flanders listens with enthusiasm but rome burns him in fourteen thirty two and his contemporaries exclaim that god has exalted him to heaven andre archbishop of crane and a cardinal being at rome as the ambassador of the emperor is amazed when he sees that the holiness of the pope in which he had devoutly believed is only a fable and in his simplicity he addresses evangelical representations to sextus the fourth he is answered with mockery and persecution then in fourteen eighty two he wishes a new council to be assembled at baal the whole church exclaims he is shaken by divisions heresies sins vices iniquities errors and innumerable evils so much so that it is on the eve of being swallowed up by the devouring abyss of condemnation this is my only reason for proposing a general council for the reformation of the catholic faith and the amendment of manners the archbishop of Bâle was thrown into the prison of that town and there died henry institoris the inquisitor who first moved against him used these remarkable words the whole world is crying out and demanding a council but no human power can reform the church by means of a council the almighty will find another method which is now unknown to us though it is at the door and by this method the church will be brought back to its primitive condition this remarkable prophecy pronounced by an inquisitor at the very period of luther's birth is the finest apology for the reformation the dominican jerome savonarola shortly after he had entered the order at bologna in 1475 devotes himself to constant prayer fasting and macerations and exclaims o thou who art good in thy goodness teach me thy righteousness translated to florence in fourteen eighty nine he preaches with effect his voice is thrilling his features animated his action beautifully attractive the church exclaims he must be renewed and he professes the grand principle which alone can restore life to it god says he forgives man his sin and justifies him in the way of mercy for every justified person existing on the earth there has been an act of compassion in heaven for no man is saved by his works none can glory in themselves and if in the presence of god the question were put to all the righteous have you been saved by your own strength they would all with one voice exclaim not unto us o lord but unto thy name be the glory wherefore o god i seek thy mercy and i bring thee not my own righteousness the moment thou justifiest me by grace thy righteousness belongs to me for grace is the righteousness of god 
so long o man as thou believest not thou art because of sin deprived of grace o god save me by thy righteousness that is by thy son who alone was found righteous among men thus the great and holy doctrine of justification by faith gladdens the heart of savonarola in vain do the prelates of the church oppose him he knew that the oracles of god are superior to the visible church and that he must preach them with her without her or in spite of her fly far from babylon exclaims he it is rome he thus designates rome soon answers him in her own way in fourteen ninety seven the infamous alexander launches a brief at him and in fourteen ninety eight torture and faggot do their work on the reformer a franciscan named john vitraire of tournay whose monastic spirit seems not of a very elevated description nevertheless declaims forcibly against the corruption of the church it were better for a man says he to cut his child's throat than put it into a religion not reformed if your curate or any other priest keep women in his house you ought to go and drag the women by force or in any other way pell-mell out of the house there are some persons who say prayers to the virgin mary in order that at the hour of death they may see the virgin mary thou shalt see the devil and not the virgin mary the monk was ordered to retract and he did so in fourteen ninety eight john lelier a doctor of sorbonne declares in fourteen eighty four against the tyrannical domination of the hierarchy all ecclesiastics said he have received equal power from christ the roman church is not the head of other churches you ought to keep the commandments of god and the apostles and in regard to the command of all the bishops and other lords of the church care no more for it than you would for a straw they have destroyed the church by their tricks the priests of the eastern church sin not in marrying and believe me neither shall we in the western church if we marry since saint sylvester the church of rome has been not a church of christ but a church of state and money we are no more bound to believe the legends of the saints than the chronicles of france john of wessalia a doctor of theology at erfurt a man of great spirit and intellect attacks the errors on which the hierarchy rests and proclaims the holy scriptures to be the only source of faith it is not religion that is the monastic state that saves us he says to some monks but the grace of god god has from all eternity kept a book in which he has entered all his elect whosoever is not entered there will not through eternity and whosoever is will never see his name erased it is solely by the grace of god that the elect are saved he whom god is pleased to save by giving him grace will be saved though all the priests in the world were to condemn and excommunicate him and he whom god sees meet to condemn though these should all wish to save him will be made to feel his condemnation how audacious in the successors of the apostles to order not what christ has prescribed in his holy books but what they themselves devised when carried away as they now are by a thirst for money or a rage for power i despise the pope the church and the councils and i extol jesus christ wessalia who had gradually arrived at those convictions boldly announces them from the pulpit and enters into communication with deputies from the hussites feeble bent with age and wasted by disease the courageous old man with tottering step appears before the inquisition and in fourteen eighty two dies in its dungeons about the same time john de goch prior at malines extolled christian liberty as the soul of all the virtues he charged the received doctrine with pelagianism and surnamed thomas aquinas the prince of error canonical scripture alone said he deserves full faith and has an irrefragable authority the writings of the ancient fathers are of authority only in so far as they are conformable to canonical truth there is truth in the common byword what a monk dares undertake satan would blush to think 
but the most remarkable of the forerunners of the reformation was undoubtedly john vessel surnamed the light of the world a man full of courage and love for the truth who taught theology successively at cologne louvain paris heidelberg and groningen luther said of him had i read his works sooner it might have been said luther has drawn everything from vessel so much do his spirit and mine accord st paul and st james says vessel say different but not contrary things both hold that the just shall live by faith but a faith which works by love he who understanding the gospel believes desires hopes and confides in the good news and loves him who justifies and blesses him gives himself entirely to him whom he loves and attributes nothing to himself knowing that in himself he has nothing the sheep should distinguish between the things on which they feed and avoid a hurtful food though it should be offered by the shepherd the people ought to follow their shepherds to the pastures but when they lead them to what is not pasture they are no more shepherds and because they are not in their duty the flock is no longer bound to obey them nothing is more effectual in destroying the church than a corrupt clergy all christians even the meanest and simplest are bound to resist those who destroy the church the commands of prelates and doctors ought to be performed only in the manner prescribed by st paul first thessalonians chapter five verse twenty one namely in so far as sitting in the chair of moses they speak according to moses we are the servants of god and not of the pope according as it is said thou shalt worship the lord thy god and him only shalt thou serve the holy spirit has reserved to himself to foster quicken preserve and enlarge the unity of the church and not abandoned it to the roman pontiff who often gives himself no concern about the matter even sex does not hinder a woman if she is faithful and prudent and has love shed abroad in her heart from feeling judging approving and concluding by a judgment which god ratifies thus as the reformation approaches the voices which proclaim the truth are multiplied one would say that the church is bent on demonstrating that the reformation had an existence before luther protestantism was born into the church the very day that the germ of the papacy appeared in it just as in the political world conservative principles began to exist the very moment that the despotism of the great or the disorders of the factious showed open front protestantism was even sometimes stronger than the papacy in the ages preceding the reformation what had rome to oppose to all these witnesses for the truth at the moment when their voice was heard through all the earth but this was not all the reformation existed not in the teachers only it existed also among the people the doctrines of wycliffe proceeding from oxford had spread over christendom and had preserved adherents in bavaria swabia franconia and prussia in bohemia from the bosom of discord and war ultimately came forth a peaceful christian community which resembled the primitive church and bore lively testimony to the great principle of evangelical opposition that is that christ himself not peter and his successor is the rock on which the church is built belonging equally to the german and slavonian races these simple christians had missionaries among the different nations who spoke their tongues that they might without noise gain adherence to their opinions at rostock which had been twice visited by them nicholas kuss began in fifteen eleven to preach publicly against the pope it is important to attend to this state of things when wisdom from above will with loud voice deliver her instructions there will everywhere be intellects and hearts to receive it when the sower who has never ceased to walk over the church will come forth for a new and extensive sowing the earth will be ready to receive the grain when the trumpet which the angel of the covenant has never ceased to blow will cause it to sound louder and louder many will make ready for battle the church already feels that the hour of battle is approaching 
if during the last century more than one philosopher gave intimation of the revolution with which it was to close can we be astonished that at the end of the fifteenth century several doctors foresaw the impending reformation which was to renovate the church andre proles provincial of the augustins who for more than half a century presided over this body and with unshaken courage maintained the doctrines of augustine within his order when assembled with his friars in the convent of himmelsfort near wernigerode often stopped during the reading of the word of god and addressing the listening monks said to them brethren you hear the testimony of holy scripture it declares that by grace we are what we are that by it alone we have all that we have whence then so much darkness and so many horrible superstitions o oh, brethren christianity has need of a great and bold reformation and i already see its approach then the monks exclaimed why don't you yourself begin this reformation and oppose all their errors you see my brethren replied the old provincial that i am weighed down with years and feeble in body and possess not the knowledge talent and eloquence which so important a matter requires but god will raise up a hero who by his age his strength his talents his knowledge his genius and eloquence will occupy the first rank he will begin the reformation he will oppose error and god will give him such courage that he will dare to resist the great an old monk of himmelsfort who had often heard these words related them to flaccius in the very order of which proles was provincial the christian hero thus announced by him was to appear in the franciscan convent at isenach in thuringia was a monk named john hilton he was a careful student of the prophet daniel and the apocalypse of st john he even wrote a commentary on these books and censured the most crying abuses of monastic life the enraged monks threw him into prison his advanced age and the filthiness of his dungeon bringing on a dangerous illness he asked for the friar superintendent who had no sooner arrived than without listening to the prisoner he began to give vent to his rage and to rebuke him harshly for his doctrine which adds the chronicle was at variance with the monk's kitchen the franciscan forgetting his illness and fetching a deep sigh exclaims i calmly submit to your injustice for the love of christ for i have done nothing to shake the monastic state and have only censured its most notorious abuses but continued he this is the account given by melanchthon in his apology for the confession of augsburg another will come in the year of the lord one thousand five hundred and sixteen he will destroy you and you will not be able to resist him john hilton who had announced the end of the world in the year sixteen fifty one was not so much mistaken in the year in which the future reformer was to appear he was born not long after at a short distance from hilton's dungeon commenced his studies in the same town where the monk was a prisoner and publicly engaged in the reformation only a year 